Hello and welcome back to another video on the channel of the 18th North Carolina Volunteers of Company A. Today we've got once again another battle narration for you. With the 22nd Virginia, the 14th Louisiana and the 6th Louisiana of the Irish Legion fighting against the 52nd New York, the 18th North Carolina and the 95th New York of the Eagle Brigade on the map Piper Farm. For balancing reasons, it was required of the 18th North Carolina to wear the blue coats of their adversaries today. A little bit of galvanizing has never hurt anyone. The engagement was opened by the 12-pounder Napoleon gun of the 6th Louisiana Artillery Detachment. While the 18th North Carolina and the 95th New York sought shelter from the shot and shell directed towards them from the cannon of the 6th Louisiana and a play of small arms musket fire delivered by the 22nd Virginia, the 52nd New York boldly took the field and faced the guns of the 14th Louisiana, which thus thoroughly entrenched upon the heights around Piper Farm. A devastating loss of life was the only outcome for both sides in this sharp and short engagement. The 18th North Carolina and the soldiers of the 95th New York, who had finally recovered from the initial artillery fire, decided that it was time to make the rebels pay for the casualties they had inflicted upon them and rose up in unison from behind the stone wall to deliver volley after volley of aimed musket fire towards their adversaries' positions. The position of the 14th Louisiana along the Piper Orchard had to be reinforced as the effect of shell and case shot sent with the sincere regards of the 1st New York Heavy Artillery and the volley fire of the 52nd New York began to take its toll on the Confederate defenders. Oh, okay, all right. Well, we'll follow you when you guys uh, head up top, top and over. Second loaded. Second platoon. Hey, man, stand by. Ich hab mich schon nicht von euch gesehen, das war nicht die Hauptstadt. Die machen, die machen, die machen die Kombi mit Schieben. Ich finde das gut, dass sie da Guck mal, die schießen und treffen überhaupt nicht so. Siehst du das? Was Lieutenant? Meldung? Und dann nutzen wir einfach die ganze Kraft auf der linken Seite. Das macht mehr Sinn. Alles gut. The commanding officers of the Union forces sensed the hesitance of the Confederate defenders to commit themselves to a straight-up firefight and assumed the bulk of Confederate infantry would be formed behind the gentle slope of the Piper Orchard. In the distance, the blue-clad troopers could spot a few lone Confederate skirmishers withdrawing behind the crest of the hill. This provided the 18th North Carolina and the 95th New York with a ripe opportunity to push the Confederates out of the orchard and towards the Piper farm buildings. They were gonna run the gauntlet of cannon and infantry fire up the slope of the hill and towards the enemy entrenchments. A storm of lead lay ahead of these poor souls. Yet the enemy was not where the Union expected them to be. Instead, they had withdrawn their forces from the orchard, leaving behind a ripe harvest of grey-clad corpses already swarming with flies in the sweltering summer heat. 
The Confederates had taken up a defensive position along a picket fence and were now firing into the flanks of the startled Union attackers. The conflict was quickly escalating, as both Confederates and Federals rushed into their firing positions, dressing their ranks as more and more men fell victim to an ever-increasing volume of lead that tore through their ranks. Caught out in the open, facing superior numbers in a superior firing position, Captain Winkler called for fixed bayonets and a flank assault on behalf of the 95th New York. The 18th North Carolina would serve as a sacrificial lamb as they were to advance upon the foe with a cheer to allow the New Yorkers to get themselves into a better position and maybe carry the day. But the enemy numbers proved too great, and their fire far too accurate. The 18th North Carolina was forced to withdraw for the time being, bloodied but unbroken. First Lieutenant Winters of the 52nd New York, having seen the results of the 18th North Carolina's advance in form of clumps of injured men and stretcher bearers heading to the rear, where the rest of the company was being reformed quickly around the colors, and having spotted the remnants of the 95th New York who had managed to entangle the enemy gun battery in a fierce melee, decided to no longer wait and ordered his line forward. In a vain attempt to support the shattered 95th New York, who had just fallen victim to a vicious flank assault by Captain Famas's 6th Louisiana Infantry, First Lieutenant Winters gave the signal to charge. His men were more than willing to follow their commander to their deaths. And with a shout of Excelsior, they went into action. The results were predictable. Most of these brave New Yorkers would never see their home again. The moaning of the wounded, the muttering of prayers from lips which were drawing their last breath, and the cries for mothers, fathers, and loved ones was audible for the Confederates for hours after the engagement had concluded. The powder smoke hung over the fields like a death shroud. Captain Winkler, who was under the impression that elements of the 52nd New York had taken control of parts of Piper Farm, led a detachment of the 18th North Carolina to lend his support to the 52nd New York struggle. But it was too late that he noticed that none of the New Yorkers had survived the Confederate onslaught, and he and his men were now trapped and under assault from three sides. The 52nd and 95th New York arrived to aid the 18th North Carolina at the double quick and threw their weight into the thick of the fighting, hoping to drive the Confederates out of their emplacements. And for a moment, it did look like they were going to be able to turn the tide and gain the day for the Union. But once again, 
Captain Famas and his brave Creole French of the 6th Louisiana Volunteers tipped the balance in favor of the Confederate defenders, and his men charged mercilessly into the unprotected flank of the remnants of the 18th North Carolina and the unaware formation of the 95th New York. The victorious shouts and cheering was renewed when fresh reinforcements arrived from behind the front line, defeating once again the hope of a Union breakthrough at Piper Farm. Yet the morale of the Federals was not broken yet. They reformed and rushed to the front line eager to show the rebels the working end of their bayonets. The 14th Louisiana, having placed scouts on an elevated position overlooking the Union approach, were able to observe and marvel at the splendid formations of the Union troopers who filed into position along a snake rail fence and stone wall at the base of the Piper Orchard. You can see the flag yeah. And soon again, Meunier projectiles were whistling through the air as the 14th Louisiana advanced to engage the 52nd New York on the same ground they had fought over earlier in the day, climbing over their dead and wounded to get into an adequate firing position. The 95th New York, supported by rifle fire of the 18th North Carolina, advanced into the orchard to scout out the enemy position and drive out some pesky scouts the 22nd Virginia had deployed within the vicinity. Yet after receiving both artillery and musket fire in sufficient quantity, their ranks faltered and fell back to the safety of the stone wall. On the right flank of the Union line, First Lieutenant Winters of the 52nd New York Infantry, believing the small raid of the 95th New York on the left flank to be the beginning signal for an all-out assault on the Confederate position along the Piper Farm barn, advanced his men, at the double quick, towards the enemy gun battery, charging them and the supporting infantry with a shout of For Lincoln and Liberty on his lips. Oh. 
Sensing an opportunity, the 18th North Carolina rushed to the aid of the 52nd New York, with 1st Lieutenant Mallow cheering the men on as they double-quicked towards the fighting. Quickly, the fighting deteriorated into individual small unit action. The 95th New York was dueling with the 22nd Virginia in the Orchard, the 52nd New York and 18th North Carolina focusing the efforts on the 14th Louisiana, and the 6th Louisiana being on the prowl again, waiting to pounce. But the Confederates did not sit idle. The 14th Louisiana Volunteers were out for blood as their officers rushed their men into position to drive the hated invaders off the sacred Maryland soil they defended. After the Union forces had been driven out once again, resources were beginning to run dry on both sides. Lack of ammunition, depleted manpower and crumbling morale began to take their toll as exhausted stragglers and lightly injured soldiers were pushed into the ranks once again for the last moments of this battle. In an attempt to relieve pressure on the Federal main thrust towards the Confederate positions, Captain Winkler ordered his company to assault the enemy gun battery as it was pouring deadly blasts of canister into the tightly packed ranks of the Union infantry, with devastating effect. The 
Defeated and exhausted North Carolinians were quickly overwhelmed by the 6th and 14th Louisiana, who pitched into them like devils, screaming and howling as rifle butts split skulls and musket shot and bayonet dropped men like flies. The field was covered in dead and dying Billy Yanks and Johnny Reps as the light of the day slowly began to fade away. The Federals attempted to assault the Confederate held position one last time without effect as at this point the federal troops were exhausted and nearly out of ammunition. The Confederates were to be called victors on this bloody day. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the small insight into our community events. If you liked what you saw, why not leave us a like or give us some feedback in the comments. We will see you next time when the 18th North Carolina goes out to war again. Stay safe and see you soon. Tar Heel!